Pierre Olivier, thank you so much for joining us, especially on the heels of this new report. So uh, I want to start first with the growth forecast for 2024. They increased since the last report from the IMF in October. What changed? Well, we had a bit of good news. So we have 3.1 percent growth for 2024. That's a 0.2 percentage point increase compared to our October forecast. And there are a combination of factors. We see a lot of resilience in a number of economies in the U.S., in China, and in many large emerging market economies, Brazil, India, Southeast Asian economies, Russia. So all of this together, that's what is lifting the growth number for this year. Behind this, what we see is we see strong demand in some countries, private consumption, public consumption, but we also see supply side forces. We see the unwinding of remaining uh, supply chains restrictions. We see energy prices coming down and we see a lot of strength in labor markets. Is China, though, a different story now? I mean, given what we've been seeing over the past few weeks, especially when it comes to the property sector, is there a concern? Well, there is a concern with the property sector. It's a concern that we already had back in October. Mm. The property sector has not been doing well for some time now. And what we're seeing is that's one of the reasons why we have slightly lower growth for China uh, next year compared to this year. So we're projecting 4.6% in 2024, 5.2% last year. But that has been revised upwards because we have also, the Chinese government has been uh, implementing a fiscal package that is trying to support consumption, trying to support households and investment, and that is having some impact on growth. Is it enough, though? Many people are saying that it's not. It may not be enough. I mean, we are concerned that this is still going to weigh down on, on output growth in China in years to come. We're also concerned about the uh, more medium-term growth prospects for China. They seem to be coming down from sort of the turbocharged growth we've had in past decades. And that's something that has to do with, you know, declining productivity growth, declining demographics. So there are a number of headwinds for the Chinese economy. Where does AI play into that? Because I know you talk a lot about AI in the report. And of course, there is the, the AI race between China and the U.S. I mean, how does that position these two countries and the potential growth, especially because you're saying it's positive? Yeah, so AI potentially could have a big impact on productivity in many countries around the world. There are very different levels of preparedness when we look at emerging market economies, low-income countries versus advanced economies, and there are potentially going to be big disruptions in labor markets. Different types of jobs and occupations Mm. are going to be affected by AI differently. Now, in terms of the impact it's going to have on overall productivity growth, it's a little bit too early to really know. We'll see. But one of the things we we do see in our study, and we did a big study that we released uh, uh, very recently, is that there are going to be the, the, there's a a bit of a winner take all, if you want, in in the AI race. There are such big upfront investments, whichever is the biggest companies are going to get there and going to, you know, be able to develop it and and make it available are going to be capturing uh, sizable returns. Do you see that materializing in 2024? Or as you said, is it too early? Are we years off for that really? It's probably going to take a few years before we see the full impact. So let's talk about potentially the, the risks, because there's a number of, of risks that are playing into the market, potentially being priced in, not necessarily uh, in all cases. What do you see as the biggest risk potentially to this growth outlook for 2024? Well, we, the, the risks, that's the big difference compared to our earlier rounds of provisions or forecasts as well, is uh, the risks are more balanced. So we have risks to the upside, we have risks to the downside. Mm. On the upside, one of the big news of 2023 that we highlight in our report is inflation has been coming down. I mean, growth has been holding steady. Inflation has been coming down. The battle against inflation is being won, and that's a very positive development. It could continue, so we could have even more good surprises on the inflation front, and that would allow central banks to ease monetary policy sooner, and so that would help lift growth. Uh, On the downside, we're concerned, of course, about geopolitical risks. We see what's happening in the Middle East, in the Red Sea. Uh, We're concerned that, you know, there could be a a tightening of financial conditions that would increase interest rates even further than where they are right now, and that would weigh down on uh, on growth and activity. Is there a concern that the markets, though, there's a disconnect, right, between what a lot of central bankers are saying and what the markets are pricing in? Uh, Is that a concern potentially as well? Yeah, the markets seem to be very optimistic about, or they were especially so towards the end of last year, and there's been some correction since, but they are somewhat more optimistic about the pace at which central banks are going to be cutting rates in 2024. 
we at the fund tend to believe that rates are likely to hold steady until the second half of the year, at least for the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, uh, the Bank of England, and then we will have uh, probably an easing of policy rates. The markets are a little bit more optimistic, and that's another source of risk, because if at some point they reassess, then uh, rates, the rates anticipated by the markets might go up. Do you think that's, that's going to happen? Because the markets are pricing in potentially a March cut. So is that really where we're headed at this point? Well, we've already seen a little bit of a correction in terms of how quickly they expect the central banks to be cutting rates. So we're seeing some of that process. Yes. I want to also talk uh, about elections because uh, a lot of the rest that you didn't mention and I didn't see really in the report, uh, there's over a dozen, more than two dozen elections that are happening uh, globally in the U.S., across the EU. I mean, India, I, there's a number of countries to name. Is there a scenario that, again, gets in the way of any sort of growth potential for this year? Yeah, so 2024, as has been pointed out by a number of people, is one of the largest election years in, in history, and I think more than half the world's population is going to be voting. And, of course, that injects a certain amount of uncertainty in terms of uh, what policies will be implemented, both in the uh, time leading to elections and then after elections, in case there are changes in, uh, in, in whoever is in, is in, uh, uh, in position of government. Uh, the concern that we have, in particular, you know, one of what we highlight in our report is the battle against inflation is kind of won. What is next? And what is next is to make progress on fiscal policy right. and to make sure that, you know, we bring back down this elevated debt levels, we reduce deficits. There is a risk that in an election year in particular, there is going to be some slippage compared to what has been announced. And we might see a little bit more fiscal stimulus or a little bit less effort at getting the fiscal house in order than uh, would be desirable. Where do you see, where is it the most concerning? Is it the U.S. that a lot of people are talking about or is there somewhere else that you're well, looking at? We've been pointing out that fiscal policy in the U.S. has been very expansionary, both you know, from a cyclical point of view and a structural point of view. So it's certainly the case that some adjustment needs to be done. And, of course, in an election year, that might be a little bit more complicated. Let's uh, also talk about South Africa, because we are in South Africa. I mean, th it's also a country uh, that is in the midst of an election coming uh, soon. Is there potentially, I mean, South Africa contributed to a lot of the downward revision, right, for sub-Saharan Africa. Is it their scenario for this election in South Africa that further puts downward pressure on this part of the world? Well, I think we, we have a, a relatively weak growth rate for South Africa in 2023, 0.6%, yeah. and a slight increase in 2024, 1%, but that's been revised down quite substantially from our October projection. We were expecting in October 1.8% for 2024. Now we're only expecting 1%. And what's behind this really chiefly is uh, all of the disruptions we've seen in the energy sector and also in logistics, in transportation, freight, uh, and ports. In and so, South Africa. In South Africa. Okay. And so that's clearly one thing that is first order. You know, that needs to be, the, that needs to be uh, you, you know, addressed. That is something that uh, the energy and logistics crisis need to be, uh, we need to find a solution. And that will be sort of the basis upon which we can have growth enhancing reforms coming down uh, uh, subsequently. So I think that's the first uh, the first item of business. Another concern in the, in, the, in the case of South Africa is, you know, the debt level, public debt level has been rising quite significantly over the last 15 uh, plus years. And that's something that is, uh, you know, creating vulnerabilities for South Africa. And so we also recommend, we were talking about the need for fiscal consolidation for South Africa. There is a need also to bring uh, public spending and, uh, under control and to raise uh, uh, tax revenues. But it's unlikely that we're going to get that in the first half of the year. And I mean, you mentioned tax revenues a country like Kenya is seeing the repercussions of raising taxes. You know, civilians are protesting across Europe as well. I mean, what's the likelihood we're going to see anything in the first half? It's difficult. It's difficult, and it has to be done in a way, and that's what we emphasize also at the fund, that protects vulnerable. I mean, it's, it's obviously when you raise taxes or when you cut uh, uh, some spending, and some of that spending may be going to the most vulnerable in, in society, we have to be very careful. We have, so this has to be part of packages that are well designed. And I want to just finish off on, uh, you know, oil prices and what we're seeing in the Middle East. Of course, uh, the situation is changing day by day. Uh, I know that's part of the risk, but, but what exactly do you think is the biggest risk to the situation in the Middle East? Is it oil prices? Is it potentially supply chain disruptions? What is it that the IMF is most concerned about here? Well, what we've seen since, uh, uh, you know, October of last year is, is of course, there's been some disruptions in, uh, in, in the maritime sh uh, shipping uh, going through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. 
now. And we've seen the increase in shipping costs uh, from Asia to Europe. They've increased quite substantially as you know, ships have to be routed around, around Africa instead of going through uh, the Swiss Canal. Uh, so the costs have increased. Right now, the impact, the global impact, if you want, on, uh, 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 you know, on the cost of importing goods and on uh, overall price levels has been very limited. And there hasn't been much of an impact on oil and energy prices. We are still in a world in which uh, the global economy is growing at 3.1. That's good news in a sense because it's not a lower number, but it's not a number that is as high as we are used to in the global economy. It's more like 3.8 is what historically uh, we're used to. And so the global economy is not growing very rapidly, and that means there is less demand, a bit less demand for energy and commodities. And so that is putting downward pressure. And despite the tensions in the Red Sea and uh, in that part of the world, we haven't seen increase in, uh, uh, in oil price. But of course, that means it's a risk factor. You know, if the, uh, if the conflict escalates, if there are disruptions to oil shipments, uh, uh, then we could see a very different uh, well, environment. Well, it's a concern, too, for a, a place like Saudi Arabia, right, that has historically relied uh, on um, oil revenue. Uh, I mean, it, is that a concern, then, for the Middle East region, then, potentially with growth prospects? Well, what's seeing, what we are seeing in, in Saudi Arabia is, is, is indeed the fact that their growth prospects have been reduced from what we were projecting in, in 2023. For, the growth for 2024 now is expected to be about 2.7%. Uh, and a large part of the revision comes from the fact that Saudi Arabia has implemented reduction in oil supply in order to try to keep the price up as part of the OPEC plus a group of countries that have you know, implemented uh, reduction in, in oil supplies. And of course, that is weighing down on, on their growth prospects. So they are, of course, an, an economy that has a growing non-oil component, but is still very dependent on oil revenues and reduction in oil uh, uh, exports are going to weigh down on, on their growth prospects. So that's the, uh, the expectation for the rest of 2024? Yes. Finally, um, I, I was getting a, a little bit of a note about Europe because I touched on it briefly. Uh, we're getting some data out of Europe today. But in particular, we're hearing Germany potentially contracted at the end of 2023. Uh, the, the expectation for the rest of 24 is that the economy will potentially stagnate. I mean, is there a mistake that could be made, though, in the euro area to further deteriorate what we're seeing in a lot of these economies. So the, the euro area, we are expecting growth that is not quite stagnating. There was 0.5% percentage growth last year, and we're expecting 0.9% growth this year. So 0.9 is a low number, but it's not stagnation. Uh, but we are seeing a region that has been hit by uh, the energy crisis. Yeah. It's been hit full force by the energy crisis, and the tightening of monetary policy is also weighing down. Uh, so the risk at this point for central banks like the European Central Bank is twofold. I mean, they need to make sure that the last bits of inflation in the system are going to be coming uh, back and, and inflation is going to hit the targets. And right now the baseline is that they're going to get there sometime, you know, towards you know, the end of 2024 and beginning of 2025. But if they keep interest rates high too long while inflation is coming down, there is a risk that they could tip over a relatively fragile economy into recession. So it's a delicate balance. Right now, as we discussed earlier, they're expected to keep rates where they are, see where the wage growth numbers are going to come in in the first part of the year, and see whether that is, you know, consistent with a decline of inflation back towards the target, at which point they will be able to uh, ease policy rates, or if they have to start, you know, to keep them where they are because there is still a little bit too much inflation in the system. Right. All right. Pierre Olivier, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your insights.